Italians have had me on the run for three solid months. But this is a game of chess. I got my pieces in position, and I'm putting their greed in check. It's time to take all of them back. Johnson, don't control all of them. He's gonna be dead by the end of the day. You can help me get the big fish and eliminate the competition. Open up my window again. My entire purpose was to spread the word of Islam. Without that, who am I? You and me are more alike than you think. I need you to stand up for me. Swear to God, things ain't going to Bumpy has turned into a liability. Now is not the time for black men to turn on each other. The scenes, the Corsicans, the French connection. I'm willing to fight them tooth and nail for every inch of Harlem. New world is here, my brothers. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Africa Roundtable. I am Katia Woods, the facilitator, and today you're in for a treat. We are doing the roundtable for the epic series, Godfather of Harlem. I'm going to introduce you to the panel. To my right, Reggie Ponder out of Chicago. Then I have Mercedes Springer out of Atlanta, or she may be somewhere else temporarily, but she's from Atlanta. Carolyn Hines from Toronto. Sharonda Williams, also from Atlanta. KB, formerly New York, but now in Houston. Ray Cornelius, also Atlanta. And Rhonda Rashan Tennis from Atlanta. And once again, I'm Katia Woods from Philadelphia. Team Africa, do your thing. Hi, KB here with the Color Grade Podcast. So my question is for Mark Juan, just as creator and EP of the show, when you were creating season two, you know, who do you find to be uh, the most unexpected adversary for Bumpy this season uh, that he may or may not have underestimated the most? And who do you feel like is his most unexpected ally? So um, your question for season two, uh, season two, we really uh, dive into the French connection and about the dough coming in from Marseille uh, to New York City through the, uh, through the port. And we have interesting characters. I think one of the characters we have is a, uh, a French, uh, French dope dealer by the name of Jean Jean and Monsieur 98. So I think that's what Mumpy's real adversaries are this season. Um, last season it was, you know, it was the Italians, but now we're dealing with a whole different international ball game with Interpol and and the uh, the Corsicans and things of that sort. So that w- that's how I would answer that question about uh, this season. Hi, this is Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago, and this is for Ilfines and Internet. I, I want to ask you guys, as a male, I'm watching this and I'm thinking that the female characters have depth. And I like the fact that they're just not, uh, you guys are just not pretty pieces, but you're the actual actresses in this. So uh, what do you, how do you see this uh, from a depth perspective? I think the writers have done a really good job of creating these characters to be whole entities, to have their own lives and their own thoughts. I mean, I know the, the large part of the story is about Bumpy, you know what I mean? We are his family and I, but I think even inside of that, the storyline that they've created set inside of his family and the struggles that we have, and he's a great man, but um, also showing that he has flaws and we have agency, we have, I, I think it's such a, it's such beautiful writing and it's such a blessing to get to work on things that you feel like you can stretch out inside of. And I feel like the writers have given us so much to play with and, with Elise especially, she's not a historical figure that you can easily research. You can't find much information about her at all. And so they've really given me a lot of backstory and a lot of things to work with. And it's been really great. I, I'll, I'll add to that. I was on a, another Zoom before this one and um, with Chris Brancato and Paul Eckstein, our showrunner and, and writer and creators. Um, and you know they said something that was so generous and kind, but also so true. And I won't say it about myself but because I can't say it about myself, but I can say it about Antoinette. So, you know, one of the questions was about strong female characters on the show that we see that we don't, we don't always see portrayed in film and on TV. Um, 
so they knew going into the first season that women would be an integral part of the show, but you know they they mentioned to have an actor like Antoinette, right? So you you plant the seeds for this for Elise to be a, a great character on a show, uh, but you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. And then the the role is is you know given to a woman so capable, right, and so talented that they're now wanting to write these stories to, to see what Antoinette will do with them. You know what I'm saying? And, and they're so wonderful um, in that regard. You know, they really take care of the cast and their actors. And, you know, I, I think everybody wants to bring it and is bringing it. So they're saying, okay, well, you know, we will we'll trust you with this and, and we're going to give you the responsibility of bringing these people alive um, and, and, you know, have, have the confidence that we'll rise to the occasion. Um, so it's really wonderful to be, to kind of be given that gift by them. Um, and yeah, you, you know. Thank you so much. I really like the fact, Antoinette, that you used the word beautiful because I do think it's beautiful. Thank you so much, you guys. Hi, so Carolyn here for Here's What Happened podcast and Carolyn Talk. So my question is also for Antoinette and Il Finesh and also a bit for Marquand because it has to do again with the female relationships and what I love about the relationship between um, between Mamie and Elise is that we're seeing these two women discover who they are apart from their relationship to, to Bumpy, right? And the thing is, is when you watch a lot of like Italian or mafia pictures, we don't really get a lot of um, in-depth knowledge of the women apart from who, from their relationships to the men. So I wanted to ask you about the progression of these characters from season, from the beginning of season one into the end of season two, into the end of season one. And what can you say about going into season two for them? Well, the writers really kind of planted the seed for these women to evolve in a in an organic way. So, you know, we see in season one, Elise is struggling with sobriety. She's, you know, she's trying to find her way. She's trying to find a path. She, you know, she's now, she's not, you know, satisfied now with just being clean. She wants to, to be a mother to Margaret, right? And then we see Mamie, who is taking care of the household and the homestead and the family while Forrest is away, kind of stepping into this more of a community organizer activist role. So by the time we get to season two, they're starting to blossom as women. And, you know, I was thinking about scene partners this season, and I think I've worked more with Giancarlo, as Adam Clayton Powell in his office, than I've worked with Forrest, who's my husband. And that's testament to, to, to the growth um, you know, there, she has a full life outside of her home and outside of her marriage. So, um, to, you know, to see that happening is kind of an actor's dream because as we know, women do exist outside of their relationships. Um, I think you'll see a lot this season of, of Il Finesh and myself going out to like get what we want. And I think that's so necessary when you're moving forward in shows like this because you see a lot of infighting in between bumpy and the mafia and you see all the things that are happening and so to see these women who are very much concerned and then very much a part of it and very much doing what they can they also have their own things going on there is also the entire civil rights struggle that um Mamie's character is dealing with and with Elise just trying to get her personal life into a place that she can be healthy enough and in a stable enough place that she could raise her child and you see them really grappling with the things that matter most to them including but not all encompassed in Bumpy and everything that's happening with him. And I, I agree um, as well. Season one, you really see Elise fighting to find herself. Season two, she's starting to evolve and find herself even more. She's finding herself a home, um, which she didn't have in season one. She's getting a, a, a better relationship with her father. And um, she's starting to realize who she is as a person and the relationship but herself and Mamie have grown much uh, fonder. Thank you. I really enjoy the performances and seeing these these two women in particular bonding, especially over their love for Margaret. So I'm really looking forward to see how that progresses in season two. Everyone, Katia Woods, Couple Soul Show. My um, question is for Ilfinesh. Um, Mike is particular. What I love about Mamie is in, in your portrayal of her, she has no um, it, false airs about her. She's very much aware who her husband is, and especially like that she doesn't allow him to put any or place any false airs about that. I mean, about himself and what he is. 
and who he interacts with. Talk a little bit about um, what it's like to share scenes with Forrest, who's, you know, who's really strong and, and he's had a long career, what that's like for you to work with an actor and, and how much room does he give you to bring what you bring to the role? He is, you know, immediately you think, oh gosh, I'm, you know, I'm going to be on a set in a scene with Forrest Whitaker. If this scene is not a good scene, it's not Forrest, right? So you, you, like, we know who's stinking it up if it's no good, but he is the most, I mean, the most kind and most giving and present scene partner, um, you know, not everybody is that way, but he, he gives you as much on your coverage as he gives during his own. Um, and that is a beautiful thing. And, and everybody wins when, when the work is that way. And when your leading man has a work ethic like, like his. Um, so, so, you know, you, you, you prepare and you do the best work you can do. Um, the nerves fall away because you, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. And Forrest is just a cool guy, you know, he's just a good guy, a decent person. Um, uh, and, you know, he, um, he, he really gives you the freedom because he's so, you know, comfortable in his own skin and prepared because he's done the work to, you know, obviously not, not, not maybe be as free as he is, but to aspire to be. Um, you know, I was talking to Antoinette earlier about this and he really, he'll do a take one way and then, you know, ask for one more and completely switch it up. And everybody's jaw is like drop. Nobody was expecting that, you know, and you think uh, like, I didn't even know I could do that. I, I didn't even, literally, I didn't even know as an actor you could do that. And now I'm filing it away for, you know, 30 years down the line in my career when I can do that kind of thing. Um, but he's just, he's a, he's a rock star. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm Mercedes here with She Critiques out of Atlanta. My question is for Maquan. Um, our culture is pretty much, has always been obsessed with mafia, the mafia bosses, and all these stories that we hear, especially when we hear Black stories about Black bosses. And I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think it is that the audience is gravitating toward in Bumpy's story? Like, what are we obsessed with that we, we want to know more about Bumpy? Well, when we were first developing this project and, you know, 18 years ago, when I was talking, what made me get the interest of Bumpy Johnson was my godmother used to tell me these magical stories about a a, a man, because let's 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 go back. Uh, Bumpy was born in 1905, right? And when he migrated to New York, he didn't come up here to become a gangster. He actually came up here to become an attorney. And when he went to the uh, bursar's office at City College, they said they didn't give financial aid to color folks. And then you know the stories that I heard and the research that I did about Bumpy, he wasn't just a gangster. He he read Shakespeare. He read Nietzsche. His urban legends. He even beat the great Bobby Fischer in chess. So the story was not just a gangster story, it was about the collision of civil rights in the underworld, about a, an older older gangster coming home and his soul is tortured and him trying to find the right way to uh, provide for his community. So it's not the uh, it's not the shaft or the hell up in Harlem or uh, New Jack City. This is about real characters. Every last character in this show is a based off of a real character. And that was my interest in uh, developing the, the character of Ellsworth Raymond Johnson. So that's why I think that people kind of really fell in love with this because this is real. Anytime you can go to uh, your computer and Google and it becomes not entertainment, but edutainment, it makes it even more interesting. Hi, Sharonda Williams from Pair Weight. So this question is gonna be for El, um, El Finesh and Antoinette. Um, you know, with your characters, we talked about a little bit about how your characters have created their own lives outside of Bumpy. But even with the consequences of what happens with Bumpy's choices in season one, it still has effects on both of your lives. And it's had um, consequences, you know, with Elise, um, Il Finesh, with your character having to, you know, leave ultimately for Bumpy's choices. But I wanted to ask the both of you, will we find really the reconciliation and healing of your characters will we see um, you confront Bumpy really about his consequences and how it affects his family in different ways. But also too, will we see that reconciliation and healing between the both of your characters 
um, because there is kind of a bumpy start in season one, but season two, we really see that this formation of family and trying to work together as a family unit. And Antoinette, we can start with you. There is, there is, there is a lot of healing, um, but life is long. And I think when it comes to Margaret, you'll see a lot of, um, there's a lot of love there for a very special little girl. And that between the person who raised her and the person who is her mother can be a very difficult thing. So there is a lot of healing and there's a family unit, but there is a lot of back and forth. And I think when you get to Elise and Mamie, they are the two people in Bumpy's life who won't take anything. It's like, I know you're a big guy, but like, we have to talk about this. We have to have a conversation. We're not gonna let you get away with this just because like, you're scary. We get it, you're scary. Now we have to have this conversation. So I think that's one of the, the great things about these two women in his life is you get these women calling him out in a way that nobody else really will because Elise has seen it all, done it all, experienced it all, been through it all. She don't care. And Mamie, Mamie is not gonna take shit from anybody especially not her husband. So I think you really get to see a side of him where he has to be vulnerable with them. And that's beautiful to see. Yeah, there was there was a point this season, I think it was episode nine, where like Forrest, Bumpy, Forrest, Bumpy, Forrest is getting it from all angles. Like the guy can't even come home and, and find peace, right? And I was just like, you know, as much as he deserved the grief he was getting at home, it's like, this guy can't get a break, right? I mean, because like Antoinette said, these ladies are relentless and they'll call him out. And that's part of why I think they are such a strong family unit is because they talk about their stuff. Um, they, they really, they hash it out. Um, as far as Elise and Mamie's relationship, I think, you know, fingers crossed, if we go six seasons, right, Marquan? Like my lips to God's ears. Um, I think they, they will probably never find total peace because, I, you know, that's that's relationships and that's the nature of relationships, especially when you have a child and such, such strong love involved, um, you know, in some way they both want to possess this baby girl. Um, uh, so so they find their peace and then they lose it again in season two and then they find it. But uh, what they are learning to do in this season um, which they hadn't uh, achieved in the first, I think is to trust each other a little bit more, um, to trust one another's intentions, at least this season. Ray Cornelius here with Upfront Inside the, uh, in the Entertainment Industry. I wanna say Marquand, this is a beautiful uh, series. I mean, the look of it is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, your nod to Romare Bearden, I was like, this is like a, a painting in motion. But my question is um, regarding Forrest uh, Whitaker as the lead. I mean, he he's such a nice person. I've got a chance to meet him and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's playing such a very hard uh, character. Was he your first choice or did you have him in mind when you were creating this show that you wanted Forrest? Because he also brings such a uh, vast history of acting to this character. Well, to answer your question, when I was first, uh, when I first started thinking about the show, you know, Margaret was, I wish Margaret was still here because she would, she would be right here answering that question with me. Uh, she was thinking about Charles Dutton, Michael Clark, Duncan, all these, and this is over 18 years ago, because she was always thinking who can portray her father. Now, fast forward, For, um, Forrest didn't only commit, first commit to play Bumpy, he committed it to produce it with me. So scripts had to be developed. And that's where Chris Brancato came in, who's the creator and the showrunner of the show. And uh, we sat down and Chris went, must have wrote about close to 24 scripts before Forrest said, you know what? I really see this character. And as an actor myself, it's not about just taking a role. You have to understand the role. You have to research the role because there's nothing out there about Bumpy. I was in the Schomburg Museum going through microfilm and old articles, Jet Magazine articles and old Harlem Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam uh, news articles just to find out about Bumpy. So Forrest loved the idea and the concept, but he really wanted to see how it would unfold on paper and if those words would jump out to him as an actor. And um, it did. And I said, you know, I believe that, you know, I, I myself, myself and Forrest, we were both method actors and I just felt like he can really get into it and uh, make Bumpy come to life. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Hey, it's Rhonda. I want to um, kind of keep that like historical portion going and talk about how you ensure some of the accuracies because one of the things that is very intriguing about the show is having Bumpy's relationship with Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X. So what are the links that you guys kind of go through? Is there a special research um, portion or aspect? I'm just interested in how you keep that history. Well, um, a lot of it is first, uh, some of it is firsthand from when Margaret was alive. She used to tell me these magical stories of how Malcolm X used to come to the house on Sunday and play chess with Bumpy. And um, even there's some uh, videos out, you know, I, I interviewed a lot of the old gangsters that are, that are still around. And some of them are like 94, 93 years old. Then I brought in a, a, a professor by the name of James Small. And James Small is very big in the African-American community. He has a, a, a bunch of uh, great videos on YouTube called Hidden Colors. And, um, you know, when Malcolm passed away, he became uh, Malcolm's sister's bodyguard. So to me, it was very important for me to bring someone who lived in that era. I mean, because I'm the youngest executive producer and, you know, I couldn't tell you about Malcolm X. They'll, they'll be looking at me like, oh, uh, what are you talking about? Were you there? But Professor Small was actually there and he was able to sit there and uh, guide, uh, guide um, uh, Grace, who's uh, playing Betty Shabazz and guide Nigel Thatch, who's playing Malcolm X and just make sure that we can get as historically as possible. And a lot of this stuff is history too, that you can see in history books and you can uh, see on, uh, on tapes on YouTube and things of that sort that we did a whole bunch of research for the writer's room. Thank you. I actually went and um, found the picture of um, Malcolm X and his family with Cassius Clay in Miami. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Carolyn again. So my question is for Marquan and it has to do with the cast. So this is a film, this is a series about um, black historical figures um, like Malcolm X, you have Bumpy, but then for the casting, you've landed some fantastic actors and a lot of them have played like iconic roles, especially in the mafia genre, like Charles Palminteri. Um, you have Vincent D'Onofrio and then um, it's like, when I saw the cast, I was like, how on earth did you guys land these? Because they've been in Goodfellas, like, you know, one of the most important films in this genre. So like, could you tell me about the casting process and then actually getting these actors to take part in your project? Well, we actually sat down, all of us, uh, myself, uh, Jim Atchison, Chris Brancato, uh, Forrest and Nina, uh, Yang Bon Jovi, and we sat down and we said, uh, if we're going to put out this, uh, this great project, we have to have some uh, great cast. And um, we just thought about, you know, I went through IMDb and I just thought about all of my favorite gangster movies. And I said, ah, oh, Paul Savino, you know, he was the best in uh, uh, Goodfellas, you know, Chaz Palmateri, Bronx Till. And uh, Vincent, we actually had breakfast with him and Vincent just wanted to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of racial undertones and things that are happening. He wanted to make sure that you know, we were okay with it. Because as an actor, you, you, you're playing make-believe, but you want people to know this is not really my character. So we sat down with him and went back and forth for uh, a week or two and Vincent was like, I'm all in, let's, let's, let's get this going. So it was really important and with the help of ABC and uh, we had some really, a really good casting directors. We had Meredith Tucker, uh, we had Vicki Thomas and it was, it was just a process of everybody uh, putting our heads together. Thank you so much. Like my Bronx still is my legit. My sister's number one favorite movie yeah. of all time. So when she saw and, that, she was like, "Yes." <laughs> and Chaz tells some great stories, man. Like it's like when he paints these stories, it's like you were there at the time, you know. So yeah, it's 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 dope to have him on set. Now, Finesh, this questions for you. Um, with your character, um, I want to talk more about your relationship with Bumpy. Um, even though I know that, you know, you're really creating your own life in season two, I do want to talk about the relationship from a romance standpoint. You can tell that there's love between both of your characters, but it feels as though that that romance has left with Bumpy going to jail and through all of the trials and tribulations that take over, take place through season one to season two. Um, I wanted to ask you, will we get to see you know, the the love, like the romance be rekindled because, you know, your character had a little tenderoni on the side in season one. So <laughs> will, we ever, will we get to explore that, explore the infidelities between both of your characters? Will that come to light in a discussion 
or will we really get to see your marriage move to a smoother pace in season two? I mean, I, we, she maybe definitely got a lot of heat for the relationship with Doug Jones. People are people do not like that. The, it, I mean, double standards are alive, you know. May, Bumpy had his relationship with Amy Vanderbilt and everybody just kind of understood that that's what men like him do. Um, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, you know, season one, there you're right. You know, it's not, it, there's not a whole lot of passion in their relationship. You know, it's not, things are not hot and heavy. Uh, but I think a lot, that's for a lot of reasons. But number one is, you know, this guy, he's been away for 11 years. Mamie's been raising a child on her own from infancy, uh, you know, sing, a single mother. Um, and he comes home and, you know, as much as she's happy to have him back, of course, you know, her love, her man, they're really relearning one another. They're, they're navigating what it's like to, to live with one another, to move in each other's spaces, um, to confront things that have happened over the past, you know, decade and change. Um, season two, I would love to say that, you know, we see them kind of get more, more intimate or more comfortable in a certain way with one another. But truth of the matter is in real talk, we shot this during COVID, um, you know, so people were really mindful of staging scenes in a way that everybody felt comfortable and safe. Um, everybody was happy to be back at work, but you know, more than, more than just work, like, you know, safety was, was number one. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of television, um, in the near future where there is not a huge amount of intimacy, um, even between couples, lovers, family, um, you know, you're told for six months to keep, or 12 months to keep six feet physical distance. And then you're thrown onto a set and told to go, you know, embrace, be near. And um, you have to gauge where people are at in, in terms of comfort. So, um, so they are definitely, you know, close as ever, um, but it is, it is sadly not that kind of um, if physical tenderness that maybe the world wants to see between Bumpy and Mamie or, or that I'd like to see even, you know? I appreciate it. I just want to let you know, I don't judge your character. She did what needed to be done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mercedes and Rhonda agree. My kind well, of like <laughs> I, I, I don't either. I don't judge your character either. I, you, you did your thing. 11 years, come on now. Come uh, on. Th this question is for you, Marquand. Uh, the, the writing in this is so good to me. And my, my question is about the, the dialogue feeling so authentic because you can do all the research that you want, but, but when it gets onto the screen where it feels like, yeah, they would say that. Talk, talk about it because you guys have done a really great job with the dialogue in this. Well, what I did uh, being the fact that Chris and Paul were writers on the project, I went and found as much dialect as I could out of the 60s. And in the writer's room, I, I had big poster boards of all the dialogue and the dialect that was happening in Harlem at the time. I was having interviews with, uh, with uh, older guys in Harlem and they would tell me, hey, we used to say, not, we, didn't, we didn't tie a tie. We say, we're we going, we going to be knotted up. I said, what does knotted up mean? He said, we're going out tonight. We're going to get knotted up, meaning they're going to tie their ties. So, I made sure that I was a great access to the writers in the writers' room from the research and making sure that the dialogue and uh, and, and the research that I've done were on point. That was my my that was my like my pet peeve. I had to make sure, even you know, in some scenes like that I might be in, I might slip up and get somebody a fist bump, and we can't shoot that. It was like they wasn't fist bumping back then, brother. They was giving <laughs> five on the black hand side. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, it, it, it was fun. And we just had to make sure that we were really conscious about the time that we were in. Wow, thank you. And you guys definitely did that. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to add to that end, the hip hop is like pretty single. Yeah. Like it actually matches. It doesn't distract from it. But I wanted to ask Infinesh because Mamie um, wrote a book, if I'm not mistaken. 
So I just wanted to know what kind of preparation you did because she did leave some testament to who she was and how she felt. So I was just curious about your research. I mean, her book is really a tell-all, you know? She doesn't, she doesn't keep anything, uh, anything, she doesn't hold anything back. Um, so without that book, you know, it was really a guide. It was really a guide for me. There's so little on Mamie the woman. I think Mark Juan sent me a few photos where you, you know, you get a sense of who she is. She's pretty stoic. You know, she's well-dressed and carries herself well, shoulders back, head up. Um, so you, you kind of gather who a person is through their body language and the way they present themselves to the world. Um, in terms of footage, a few, a few clips of her in her later years on YouTube, but um, the book was, was really the number one resource um, for me in creating uh, the character, but also just having, you know, grown up in Harlem, like I, Mamie Johnson was my next door neighbor, you know, not, not literally, but she's all of the women that raised me up um, in my, in my youth, seeing the way that they move and interact with each other and carry themselves and, and dress, you know, sweet as pie, but also no nonsense. So you take all of, I mean, it was just, you know, by luck or miracle or chance that this project, you know, fell in my lap and I happened to have been raised in Harlem, you know, where this woman kind of found herself. So, um, so all that went into it, but just this feeling of having Mamie in my bones. And then obviously the hair and the makeup in the series and the, and the wardrobe, like 50% of creating Mamie, I think was given to me in the chair and in our wardrobe fittings because you, you put all those pieces together and it's impossible not to take on uh, this, uh, you know, this otherness kind of. Thank you. My name is Gil Robertson, president of the African-American Film Critics Association. The three of you are absolutely, we're absolutely fantastic. We appreciate you spending a little bit of your afternoon with us. And uh, we are looking forward, very much forward to all of the exciting things that I'm sure are in store for us for this next season. On behalf of the world's largest group of black film critics, thank you for watching this episode of AFCA Roundtables. Have a great day. Almost had a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.